Professor Fatik had asked me to talk a little bit about some effective teaching and learning strategies that we can use primarily for CS101, but I think these uh, span across many domains, many contexts. And a lot of what I've borrowed is uh, research done in, um, or this research, uh, what I'll be talking about has been done in education and psychology for many decades, in fact. But what's new is in science and engineering classrooms. And my background is from physics, so I can speak uh, that in the physics classrooms, we've been now gathering data and doing systematic, uh, systematic, let's say, un trying to understand how people learn and what strategies might help students learn better, which also me, which uh, translates or which sort of the next step is how to use those to improve teaching. So that's the context of where it's coming from. And uh, let me hear a little bit from you because the first thing, I mean, a lot of things I'll say might sound nice, but we all have problems. So the first thing I'm going to ask is, what are some typical problems you face in your classes, either from your side or student side, any problems? and. Maximum, the student will not answer any questions. Students won't answer questions, okay. Non-responsive students. Just keep going, let's hear a few. Non-responsive audience. Any problem, I mean, if you want to do a good job in the classroom, and most of you are from the university systems, and they're... Or they hesitate to answer the question. Okay, okay. Hesitate to ask a question. Or answer. Hesitate to ask and answer questions, okay, more. It can be a personal issue also. Uh, I think maybe due to like uh, some personal problems in students, mm -hmm. uh, of students, uh, they behave differently in the classroom. Okay, Dif no. students behave differently, may not be exactly the way we want them to. I guess let me try to specify my question. Suppose we want to we're all excited, we want to do a really good job teaching, we want them to learn our subjects, we are passionate about it. But that doesn't always happen. So what are some possible reasons? Yes, please. Uh, with some junior faculty, they tend to dominate a lot, like they don't allow them to teach. Uh, like if the faculty is not highly experienced, students somehow uh, have a full domination on them. And they don't allow, there is a very poor classroom management from that faculty. So classroom management is a problem, right? Sometimes uh, maybe they know the answer very well, but they are not able to uh, answer in a to the point or uh, communication, communication problems. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes all the students uh, try to answer, so they, you you get a, a big noise. Okay. You can't judge. Okay, fine. So we'll see what to do about noise. In fact, in some of our systems, noise is good. Yeah, so noise we'll see is how good. to use it. <laughs> Example: You ask question, a quiz. Uh -huh. A is right, B is right, C is right. Some group will say yeah, some group okay, will say so we'll see see how like to, that. That's something we can address today itself. And it's similar to what Dr. Sangeet also mentioned earlier. Anybody else? I have a few things I thought of, but I think it's good to hear from everybody. Anybody else? Uh, sometimes they are very exam oriented, as in that if you try to tell them something else, they exactly. don't want to listen to it. If exam it's not coming right, in the exam. Right. That's a systemic problem we have, right? And uh, also if you're teaching specific courses, like I teach MSc also and I teach MBA and IT also. Mm -hmm. So for MBA students, they don't want to know anything technical. If you okay. give them a case study, they'll take it. But if you try to tell them architecture, they don't want. Okay, so students' backgrounds are different yeah. and they want different things, okay? Uh, in a class of 60 or more, it's sometimes very difficult to know whether uh, how much of uh, the content has been understood by the students. So feedback for the instructor. How do we know what students understand, especially in large classes? Yeah. And one answer as well, the exam tells us, but ideally we want to know right away. Yeah, right? everyday session. Mm -hmm. like. Okay. Some time constraint will be there. We have uh, classes after 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock. So we have yeah. to complete the syllabus. Yes. No. Uh, one sense is complete the syllabus. Actual time level will be at the time. Okay. So the students will not be in position to okay. listen it. So let me just show you some of the things I thought of and uh, there is some overlap. I think I heard a couple of new things also. So some possible problems are you have different levels of students, different interests. I think uh, the lady from symbiosis, you said that. Also, people learn differently. You don't know exactly how they learn. I didn't hear anybody say that students are bored and they tune out. Well, non-responsiveness is probably similar to that. But it's a very common situation. The teacher is talking for an hour and students are playing games in the back or doing something. 
exam orientedness that is my third point and so and a lot of other problems that some of you said. So, the main question we face here and we face both as teachers and as somebody as people who want to try to understand this problem systematically and try to do something is in spite of all these how do we do a good job and also why should we be even bothered to do a good job. Right? So, there is really no single prescri prescription I, I can't give you that nobody will give you that and the one second the problem is there are varying opinions the everybody thinks there is one good way to do things. So, that is a problem yes sir. back. Uh, I think I have met a different set of students that is a statement all students want is good marks. Okay, most not not all. <laughs> I let me. I should not say that. That's my mistake. Because I have met some students, they are at least bothered about accepted. Marks. Mistake accepted. Uh, some students or many? Can I say many or some? Many, many. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so there is no single prescription, but there are some general guidelines which have come out of people studying things and all some are from personal experiences, but again these are from you know people led systematic studies as well as theories on how students learn. And the idea is that we need to take into account the population as a whole and I like that M MBA versus MSE example because there the population as a whole has some characteristic, but at the same time individual differences matter. So, somehow this this is important and we have to take this into account. Now, about things uh, students uh, talking too much or dominating, one thing that people say is that as instructors we fail to set expectations. In the sense we say this is the content, this is what we need to do, but what is acceptable in the class and what is not acceptable in the class, somehow we are hesitant, we do not some we, we, we do not always say it. Again none of these is a, a huge generalization, but these are common things we do especially junior faculty. So, if we know that we need to set expectations early either orally in class or even written that this is acceptable in class and these rules are not allowed, set them early and be consistent keep trying to en enforce them and I do not mean police them, but just keep repeating them what is acceptable and what is not. Uh, including things like students are expected to be physically active in class no sleeping, but also mentally active. So, I expect you to do it that is so I am setting the bar very high, but I from my side I will make sure that the class is engaging enough that hopefully you do not fall asleep. Then the last two things really are what I think we need to get at what is, why are our students in class what are their goals we really need to have a good idea about that. And now I am going away from exams that well exams is one thing, but they are all there for reasons and lastly what are our goals why are we teaching I mean yes it is a job, but something more than that you know why are we doing why are we in that class teaching that. So, we will try to spend time on some of these and the reason I put what I want to do in the next slide is just take the previous two slides and put them next to each other these are the problems we talked about and these are some of the guidelines. And the guidelines you can see are sort of they address the problems. If we say that all students want good marks we need to ask them well what are students goals and see if we can go from that angle take the same problem and turn it into a question for us as to what to do next. Yeah, so each one of them I, I try to do a one on one match ok. So, everybody ok so far you know all this sounds great in theory, but what how do I actually practice it that is I think that is the stage we are all really at. So, from now on I will just work with examples this is not comprehensive these are just some strategies which have known to work. Some of them have about 10 years worth of data on that these strategies are very robust and they have worked in many classrooms in different subjects different levels. So, this the way you implement the clicker questions is one of them. Um, and I will also try to base each of these examples on on some cognitive theory or some study that has been done ok. So, I am going to show you three questions this is from middle school mathematics. And I just want you to look at the questions ok. So, I, I chose this topic because I think all of us even we may be from different domains, but we are very familiar with it. So, this is one question ok. This is the second question which of the following has a slope of half there are three lines and I will flash the third one just look at it read it for a minute.
Okay. Got a chance to read them. Okay, so I have two questions for you. What is similar about these three examples? The first thing that's similar. They all have to do with the same content. Okay. And they're all roughly at the middle school mathematics level. Maybe I don't know, seventh standard or something? Seventh, sixth, seventh, eighth, something like that. Next question, what are differences? Representations are very different in the three questions. One has graphical, one has numerical, one has equations. Excellent. Others? Other differences? You want to see the three questions again? Okay. Something about the... So conceptually, there is actually a, a different hierarchy, different yeah. level. So the third one seems to be a little more sophisticated or deep. You can use it either way than the first one. The first one is to practice how to use the formula for slope. And the third question is you really have to understood and you have to be able to apply it. Is anybody familiar with this thing called Bloom's taxonomy of learning? So. Uh, I, I don't remember when this was, but in uh, cognitive science, there are these taxonomies of cognitive learning. In a sense, when you learn, there are different levels at which you are le learning. And the lowest, and they are in increasing order of sophistication, and the higher levels comprise the lower levels. So just to give you an example, the very first level of learning, they say, is knowledge, factual knowledge. What is an apple? Okay, this example is from Wikipedia, by the way. The second example, they say, is comprehension. The third one they say is application, and that's where we start coming in. You know, how do you apply your knowledge into a new situation? And then it goes into something called analysis, where you apply it, but you also have to do some, it's not a direct application, but you have to do something else. Uh, and it goes on and on, and the last or the higher stages go into design, synthesis, evaluation, making judgments, etc. So these questions are at different cognitive levels. Now, Typically, a lot of our exams focus on the first kind of thing. We rarely, and we do try to include a few of the others, but why, why not? What we really want our students to do is to be able to conceptually apply things to new situations, which means right from the beginning, we need to start including those questions, both in class as examples as well as on tests and homeworks, and we'll come to that. So let's see what I have said. So examples one and two, there's a difference also in computational difficulty. You know, the, so that's a minor thing. And difference in representation is a very important thing. One key strategy that uh, people have studied is this idea of multiple representations. And as engineers and scientists, you open any journal. What do you see if you open a technical journal or science or something? Just open any random page. What, what do you see there? Hmm? You see formulae. What else? Graphs, text, pictures. We see a lot of pictures actually open and even in hardcore engineering journals. So as experts, we use representations a lot, not just for making information convenient, but as you mentioned, in some representations, problems are much easier to solve than in other representations. So as what we want to teach students is how to figure out the best representation to approach a problem. It starts from just giving simple questions where they have to use alternate representations, but then it proceeds to trying to make a judgment on what representation is better and what's not. And example three, okay, it's highly conceptual, and even if students have previously seen a slope, they'll be interested in that question. Whereas the first question, if they've seen a slope in fifth standard, they'll roll their eyes and they'll say, well, you know, I know how to do this. So there is a challenge and interest built into this conceptual difficulty. Okay, so let's try to do some, and where I'm getting at is uh, one of the classroom techniques we do is pose a multiple choice question and have students vote on these choices. And the noise issue I'll come to in a moment. Uh, constructing these questions is what this slide is sort of getting at. The kind of questions we want to construct is not very straightforward factual knowledge kind of questions, but where some thinking is involved, some representations are involved, and there's some extra thing going on. So let's try a room, uh, sorry, let's try a question in CS101. This is where the clickers come in, but what I want to do first, so I'll, what we'll do now is exactly the way we do it in class. So it's sort of a demonstration come lecture. 
I, ideally, I would have liked each one of you to have your own clicker. So since you have only one for two or three, I don't want you to switch it on right now. So first, we'll do the low-tech way. And no talking to your neighbors right now. I'll flash the question, and there'll be four or five choices. I want you to vote with your hands, one, two, three, four, but don't keep it up here, because then everybody else will see. I want you to keep it here. One, two, three, four. That way I can see everyone, but there's no copying going on. And this is really effective. And uh, now there are about 25, 30 people. Even with about 70, 80 people, I've seen people do this. There is a downside. We'll talk about the downside in a moment. But so let me flash the question. Uh, think for, I don't know how, 15 seconds. When I say vote, I want all of you to vote. Simple for you, I think, hopefully. OK, vote. I do, I see a lot of abstain, actually, can you keep it a little higher? Okay. Okay. So, what I want you to do next is the following. I want to, you to talk to your neighbor, convince them of your answer, or be convinced of your, their answer. Have a discussion on a table, and when you're ready, I'll have you vote. Now you can use the clickers, and you can vote on the clicker. So I'll give you as much time as you want. You're allowed to change your mind. You're allowed to now talk and copy and do all those things. Go ahead. So let me set this up. OK, everybody done? So this took about, I don't know, 60 seconds or so. And now what we will do is so you can start clicking, getting your clickers on. Power them on, press A, and then immediately press B. These choices look a little different. I'm uh, okay. Just pick one of these choices. I hope your right choice is in here. Pick it, and after you press A and B and get the power on, put the choice. Click the choice in your uh, clicker. Just store it. Ah, time pause. Pause. Thank you. Uh, okay. So has everybody pressed their choice into their? Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect the responses. Okay, that's all I have to press now. And what is happening now is that the receiver is coming, talking to your clicker, and getting your responses. You can operate it for me. Okay, so now the responses have been collected successfully. So what I want to do is show you the histogram of the responses in both cases. The numbers will be different because it's about half of the earlier one. Earlier one, we didn't do it electronically, but I was actually noting down. So I'm just going to show you the numbers okay, earlier. This was what roughly the distribution was earlier. I saw a lot of ones, a few twos, a fair number of threes. And now let's see what the distribution is now. Half and half. Okay, so this at this. So let's see what has happened now. Firstly, how many of you changed your answers? Okay, let's say about one third of you say you have changed your answers. It's feedback for me. The first round of voting is feedback for me. That at that point, if all of you have the same answer and if it's roughly the same answer, I'll say, okay, this concept we've got it. Let's move on. If there was a distribution like the one I showed you on paper, you know, some were A, some were B, some were D, etc., then I know that, okay, we need a little bit of further discussion. Right now, it's going very slow. Later, I'll tell you the whole thing. Once you know how to do it, it takes about five, four to five minutes per question, maybe even four minutes. Okay, so if I get a response like this, this is a little surprising for me because it looks like half of you have answered. Oh, well, you want to do this again? Again, okay, excellent. So I'll just repeat the whole thing. I'll. Uh, next question is the same question. Okay. So what I'm going to do is let me try to. This is the first time I'm handling this software. You press A and B, store your answer, and then we'll collect 
responses. Store your answer immediately. Press A and B to wake it up. Okay, no, reset it first. Reset, press A, and then uh, put your answer in. Everybody program their answers? Yeah? Okay, collect. I don't know what's. And do the bar chart. Okay, so we seem to have 7 plus 2. I think we have 10 clickers here, so except one, all the other responses have been collected. So, firstly, there seems to, now 7 means actually 14, at least 14 if not more, because you have 1 per 2 or 3 people, actually many places 1 per 3 people. So, let us say this is 1 is 15, what was D? D choice was none of the above. So, what I, one thing I want you to see is that many people change their answers, many people, the number of answers of 1 has gone up, okay. Manual answer, there was 10 and there were a number of B's and C's also. Everybody who said B's and C's have now gone away. And there are some people who say none of the above. So, let us look at the choices. I will just go close this. Uh, let us look at the choices. So, none of the above, I am interested. Or not none of the above, people who changed from B to A. Anybody who changed from B to A? Anybody who changed from C, to, yeah, B to A. Can you tell us why you changed from B to A? This is exactly what you want to do in class. Just very quickly. First, I thought, uh, first I thought uh, B will be correct. Yeah. After discussing with the friend. So, what uh, was not right in B? Or why would B not work? Uh, there is no multiplication yeah, operator. The syntax. So, this is how we write, but the program does not understand it. Anybody change from C to A? No. Anybody who had chosen all of the above earlier? There were a couple of people who had chosen number 5. Nobody? Uh -huh. well, it is not, it was in my, I do not know, there was some miscommunication. So, things like people are changing their answers. This gives you an idea, and th these answers are simpler. Okay, this was a fairly straightforward example, but I will show you a little more complicated one, where going through each choice actually is instructive for the entire class. Okay, thanks. I think this is the only actual clicker question we will do. I will show you examples of others. Any questions at this point? Yes. You showed us the response, right? When you were doing the manual note of each mm -hmm. choice. Actually, I had given four. You had given four. I might not have seen it. Okay. So, you, yeah. So, like, uh, how do you make it practically possible? So, the downside of doing a hand thing is that counting for the instructor is a little difficult. That is a big downside. If you are not very interested in the actual numbers, here I did want to show you the actual numbers to show that how it shifts. And this is very typical. Each time there are some people depending on the level of the question between a quarter and three quarters of the class changes their answers. And usually the answers shift to a very narrow distribution centered around the right answer. The advantage of doing it completely electronically is that you do not have to count and that is automatically recorded. So, what Professor Fatak is trying to do is to get these clickers into all the colleges and since we are developing it in house with this great team, uh, it is still, we are able to manage the cost and it is a we are able to do it. We can buy them on the market, they are available, all the corporate folks are using it, Wipro and Infosys, they use it for the training programs. It is a little expensive if we buy them. I mean, it is expensive, not just a little expensive. Commercially, they are about 2,500 rupees per device. So, in the US, it is 30 dollars, which is again affordable by students. Here, we cannot afford that. So, they are trying to manufacture it for a quarter of the cost. Other questions, <laughs> comments? I will show you more interesting questions in a moment. Yes, we are not electronically, but with show of hands. We are in Professor Fatak's course, I will show you. Okay, why do not I show you some of his questions? I um, will come back to what, what this is about. Just examples, okay. So, there is a function f, it's written there, 
and the question is what is the return value? So when we are doing functions, we flash this and show the choices. I'm not going to discuss the answers right now. You can do it later. This is a little bit about syntax, but do you want to talk to each other? Okay, I'll show you the next question. Just pay attention. It looks very, very similar and especially in the second sentence, the int f. Next question is identical almost except what happened here and what happened here. Previous question, next question, okay. So this is together, so I've done two changes and just if you want to point these out, these questions you don't have to do it twice. Again, this is a fairly straightforward question. You don't expect too much difficulty. So you can just have everybody vote once individually. But a question like the next one, and this is borrowed from Professor Fartek's course. So uh, I'll just explain what this is. We were trying to estimate pi by calculating the area of a unit circle. And we decided, well, unit circle is too big. You don't have to computationally do the whole thing. It'll take too much time. So let's do a one fourth. It's symmetric. So this code here is to calculate the area of one fourth of the area of the circle. I, I don't know if it's the entire code or the snippet of the code. So Professor Fartek spent, a, I don't know, some 10 minutes going over this code in class, etc. And the idea of what the next question is about the declaration of the variables. So I, J, and N. So I counter and J counter are uh, those dots, are the coordinates of each point. I goes along the x-axis, uh, J goes along the y-axis. They've been declared to be integers. N, I think, is the total yeah, total number of points because in the end you're dividing by n square. Okay, so the question he posed and this was written by him. I kind of like this question very much. The question is on, can everybody read it? I'm sorry, I had to type it small. He says we've declared our variables i, j, and n as integers. What is the effect of this declaration on the estimation of pi? Effect as in, in the error, really, because we are, it's still an estimation of pi. How close will we get to pi? Will there be a large effect because we declared it as integer? So will it, well, will it be a negligible effect? Will it be a large effect and due, large effect due to reason B or due to reason C? And maybe, so the thing is, I'm a little embarrassed to say this, I've forgotten the answer to this. And since you are all more experts in this, anybody wants to take a crack at what's happening here? It's a non-trivial question. That's what I, I sat in this class and <coughs> students were really split. I'll tell you the results. Students were split between B and C and there were some A's. Anybody has a comment about this question? No effect? Everybody? Answer? Okay, fine. I'll just move on. You can talk to Professor Fartuk if you have other... I somehow remember something differently. Why don't we talk about this when he comes back? Okay. So, so this was a fairly non-trivial question. So these are the kind of questions we write. Uh, very conceptual, usually not much calculation involved, not much numbers involved. Fairly challenging. We give same questions on the tests also, a few questions like this, so students know that we are being serious about it. And the actual learning is happening in the period which the instructors usually don't like, in the noise period. When you're convincing your neighbor, when you change your answer, or when you're trying to defend your answer, you're learning principles of scientific argumentation, you're trying to do evidence-based reasoning, and usually that period when you talk to your neighbor that we limit it between one and two minutes. And we want the group to arrive at a group consensus. So that's where the actual learning is happening. And people have done real studies as to, is it that they simply changed their answer or did they actually learn something? So they'll pose a question, they'll collect all this data, then they'll pose an isomorphic question and see if people answered incorrectly the first time, how many of them did correctly in the isomorphic question. And the numbers went up drastically. So if you just do question one and question two, which is similar but not the same, the numbers of correct versus incorrect was the same. But if you do question one, then discussion, and then question two, different question. Then the number of correct answers in question two shot up. Fairly robust method in the sense the learning gains have been shown to be quite high. 
other advantages, I'll just scroll back a little bit. One of the names is peer instruction because you're learning from your peers. It works, students are actively engaged, nobody is falling asleep, it's a game. If students' egos are involved, it's great because now they can convince. In a place like IIT, it's very common. Everybody thinks they know the best, the students. So they really want to convince their neighbor. Uh, students learn from each other. So this idea of learning from each other and learning as a social process, again, has deep roots. And you talk, actually all of us, I think, will agree when you say, if I ask you a question, the answer is hidden somewhere there. When did you learn some subject the best? When you teach it, right? It's such a common answer that a lot of us give. That's exactly what we're trying to simulate in class. And the thing is, because the questions are a little challenging, but in the same domain, even people who have done this before are interested. So you're targeting different levels simultaneously. So this problem of varying levels gets addressed to a small extent. This was, uh, in physics, it was pioneered by Professor Eric Mazur of Harvard, where he realized that students were doing really well in uh, mathematical questions with circuits and Kirchhoff's laws, but they did horribly in questions like this. So he said, well, something's wrong, we need to do something. And I think in 1997 was when, 97, 98 was when he did it. And now it's caught on quite a lot. So physics, chemistry, biomaths, earth sciences, I know references. It's catching on in engineering also. Excuse me. Yes. Ma'am, uh, I have done a similar quiz in uh -huh. my class. Actually, what I did was uh, the students were grouped into teams, yeah. and every group will have uh, below average, average, and best students. Mm -hmm. So, whenever we, uh, I used to uh, display the quiz in PPTs, and the answer will be on the next slide. So, they will have a discussion among themselves, and they have to come up with the answer in mm -hmm. a uh, time, time mm -hmm. period, mm -hmm. limited period. But the problem is the discussion will be only with the best students, among the best students. They will not be able to share it with the Did that happen? the okay. the, the poor students because they will be tends to come up with the right answer always. So, okay. so, uh, so later on I will mm -hmm. have to explain it. Mm -hmm. After every slide, I uh, will be explaining the answer again, the, the reason behind that particular answer. Okay. And uh, so I don't know whether the learning is really happening among the students. Okay. So let me, if uh, it is uh, yeah. through the quiz mm -hmm. within a uh, right, limited right. period. Let me address her a couple of points here. So she is actually formally grouping them and this is again done and recommended. And Typically, we, recommended, we recommend that the groups be heterogeneous. You don't want all the high students together. So what you do is what is usually recommended. Now, how do you get, there are two problems with this. One is that the so-called st good students dominate. And second is that the people who usually stay back just never participate. So there are some ways to make this happen. If you have if you have access to a TA or you yourself can go around, sort of encouraging people to speak. That's one thing that's possible. Second thing is we have, um, we rotate roles in a group. So what is done is one person is supposed to be the debater, one is supposed to be the uh, note taker, and the third one is the arbiter or the judge, something like that. And the, so each person in a group, by the way, groups of three or four is usually recommended. Um, uh, so each person is assigned a role, and then we rotate roles every class. So everybody has a defined role. So today only this person is allowed to speak. Tomorrow the other person is allowed to speak. That's one way of doing it. This happens in the, what I have seen from personal experience is that this happens in the beginning usually that the groups are not functioning very well. But if they achieve a level of trust among themselves, it, say by the fourth or fifth week it starts becoming better. That's my personal experience. But you have to sort of kick them. The weak students will not be able to uh, come up because uh, they are a little hesitant to hesitant. express their answer because they feel that they lose, their group team may lose points. Oh, oh by the way, so, a very important thing I forgot to say. These are best done if you don't have marks associated yeah, with it. <laughs> do it ungraded. If you want to use it for a quiz, do it separately. But don't have them discuss this whole discussion business and voting business. It's ungraded. So the pressure is off. It's not for us to evaluate how good the students are. It's for them to learn from each other. It was not added to the grade sheet and all, but uh -huh. just for fun, I used to give marks for all marks. the teams. So what we do is that we give marks for people if they answer something, regardless of what it is. So it's a way for us to take attendance. So we're being a little sneaky there. If they don't answer, they lose points. But if they answer anything, it doesn't matter what choice they do, they get points for that. So let's say we typically we do two, one to three per one hour class. Sometimes only one if it's a conceptually hard one. Sometimes two or three. 
It's also good to collect feedback right in the beginning. So the first question Professor Fatak did is, how many of you have seen a computer before? This was a class of 850. You'd be surprised there were 20 people who had not touched a computer in IIT, first lecture. Then the next question is, how many of you have done anything beyond email and web browsing? How many of you have done programming? How many of you have done C++ programming? So all these data we have now, right on day one. So it really helps us design the following classes. Because if I know, if, if, if I, it looks like 80% of the class has written some program, I can move ahead faster. We also have a database at the back end of it which tracks individual students. We don't use it for any bad purposes, but if a student is doing poorly on quiz after quiz after quiz, we target them, give them extra help. If somebody is doing well, really well, quiz after quiz after quiz, the, uh, we haven't implemented that yet, but the idea is that we sort of pull them apart and do some extra things for them. So if you want to try to address this issue of different levels, it's possible. Um, You'll see a lot of examples and videos of it being done and also how to write questions on this website. So this is called the Carl Wyman CW, Carl Wyman Science Education Institute. Carl Wyman was the 2004 Nobel Prize winner in physics. He did atomic physics, but after that, he used his Nobel Prize money to set up these science education institutes. And now he's doing full-time science education research. They've put up a lot of information, resources, which you can, and it's all downloadable for free. And there's something called a clicker guide. It's a 30-page handout. I found it really useful when I try to prepare these questions. We need your help. So along with your syllabi and test questions, we are preparing a library of questions for CS101. So if you have either written some of these questions, especially you said you've done it, right? Or if you want to, if you've tested some of these out, somebody else might have written it and you've tested them out, give us feedback. So eventually we want this huge library of what questions are there, which are good questions, which work, which don't, etc. Questions? Concerns? Yes? Can you suggest uh, some mechanism or techniques where a teacher have, didn't have any PowerPoint presentation? If uh, you do it on the board, you mean? Yes. And okay. similarly, no teaching assistance. Okay, fine. So only the person have it in a class. How many students? 80. 80 students, okay. okay. So I was teaching a class of about 30. That was the only difference, but I had nobody with me, and it was all chalk and blackboard. What I used to do is photocopy these questions. I used to do two things. Uh, sometimes I used to come to class early, write the question and the choices on a corner of the blackboard and cover it with something, like a screen or something. Uh, and then when this, we actually had to do the question, I used to pull up and flash them the question, if that's possible. If even that's not possible, I used to photocopy these quizzes on paper, and actually not even the whole piece of paper, on half or a quarter of it, small ones, and hand it just before we do it. So they read it and they do it. So you don't need teaching assistance there because, see the thing is, you don't have to do it every class. In fact, you probably should not do it, you don't overdo anything. But doing one per class, in, in Fatak Sir's class, we are doing about two or so per class. And that really anchors the whole class. And for us, we know that that's the key idea we want to get at. So the most important thing you want to really get students to learn, write a question based on it. Forget about collecting data on how many students and all. This is more for them to think about it and talk to each other. Sometimes I would, uh, Assign it as homework, ungraded homework, and the first thing, the following class, ask somebody to talk about it. So they know where, instead of saying, in last class we did blah, blah, and blah, we say, okay, last class there was this question, what are the answers? So that was one option. Other questions? Okay, so um, we did this, let's see. Little, some more strategies and going back to our first problems and guidelines. And this is a little provocative statement, really. And the reason I say our job is not to teach is really because what we want to do is have students learn. That's our real, real job. And one of the first things we need to know is we need to know what students know, what prior knowledge they come up with. What's written here, the, first, the second sentence? It's very hard to learn something that we almost already do not know. 
it's a very well established cognitive and philosophical principle that in order to learn something you need to know almost everything associated with it which also means you learn incrementally what you know prior to what affects very deeply what comes next this is uh, in introductory science and maths classrooms this comes every day teachers face this they call misconceptions like i push an object and newton's laws you know which were written in the 1600s say that the object should keep moving forever most students will say no they stop because that's what happens in real life you push an object it doesn't keep going it stops but the theory says it should keep going forever so even if you keep saying this is the theory this is the theory the moment you write uh, the moment they have to answer a real question they go back to their prior knowledge that it should stop and they get into difficulty so how do you get across i mean what we have to know is that we can't simply erase their previous knowledge and now there is some mri of neuroscience research that says that you can't erase neuron connections which is what neuroscientists define as learning all you can do is build new connections and hope to make it stronger okay so prior knowledge and the other useful techniques so this we are doing in another computer science networking class learning by analogy is a very effective tool we do it in daily practice we also do it formally as engineers and scientists when we are doing research a lot of things are done by analogy and this very famous example is the atomic model of uh, central nucleus and the electrons was inspired by the solar system and there are many examples you'll find so this is a very useful technique um i'll give you i haven't put it on this i'll give you a website there is uh, we have a faculty member here called professor shridhar ayer and he's written a series of stories for children in this journal called not journal in a magazine called jantar mantar you heard of jantar and they are all about networking principles routing and uh, ip and protocols and all but they're all with stories that there was a princess she's in a trapped in a tower really beautiful articles and so you can look at those for examples how analogy is used uh, okay th those are for children we are doing it now in an mtech class we are not using princesses and uh, devils because you know it's not appropriate for mtechs but we are using ceos and secretaries same analogy uh next principle is that people learn differently we've talked about this so uh, this is sort of the hardest one that people learn differently we need to be aware of this there's no unique answer what's the best way to teach but one thing that's not the best way to teach is how we learned and all of us here are really special you know we are we are like why would an ordinary person study years of computer science and then also want to teach that so the way we learn is a poor guide to how people learn and uh practically that most of us teach the way we were we learned so just be aware of this that that's a big step ahead okay students goals we need to really give students what they want which means we need to talk to them in their language set a context it sort of goes back to the first point that we need to know what they know but what is it that excites students if it's some so here in iit bombay you you heard about the satellite project the other day or some there's also some people building race cars but whatever excites them and there's a generational gap i agree but something that's relevant to them if you can connect to what you're doing in some computer science courses it's very very possible cs101 it's programming you can take an example from any topic and write a program for that if if it's very theoretical you can okay the other thing you can do is a lot of these people will be going into industry so if you're teaching software engineering for example go to industry get cases from industry what kind of projects do they build in software engineering use those instead of the textbook examples okay this final thing the one about exams oops this is uh, we'll talk about how to actually do it but it's you can't get away without it if you do all these great things in class but the exams are your traditional what is the spelling of apple it won't work so somewhere or the other your exams and your assessment should reflect what we value the content the skills even the attitudes we want them to think critically we have to write questions which make them think critically so another example professor dhamdire from cs department here he is doing uh, 
in his exams, I, I just vaguely remember this, so I may be slightly wrong, but in his exams, there are two kinds of questions. Both have marks. One is called routine questions, one he calls as thinking questions. So he labels them and he says routine questions get through them in so much time, you'll still get marks. Thinking questions, you re these are challenging and finally to pass an exam, pass the exam, the student has to get at least a certain level of marks in the thinking questions. So there's an overall cutoff, but there is also a certain cutoff a level set for the thinking questions. So you can't do really well in the routine questions and do poorly on the thinking questions and pass. So this is where I think there'll, I, there'll be many concerns from your side. Constraints, right? Do you want to talk about it a little bit? Can you do this? Can you make your exams reflect? In Amrita, probably you can, right? You have the freedom. Some freedom. Yeah. So if you have any, even a slightest amount of control over exams, it doesn't have to be the final exam. It could be a quiz, mid-semester mid quiz. It could be an informal pop quiz in the class. But if you have the slightest amount of control, put these questions on the exam. It doesn't matter how many points they are worth. So now we are exploiting psychology that even if something is worth 2%, students will work for it. Except some IIT students who calculate and they say, well, it's worth only 2%, so I won't bother to learn. But usually, if it's worth some percent, even if it's, so if 2 or 5% is so small that your final grade distribution doesn't get affected, but you've still sent this message. So the exams, do you have control or is it set by somebody else and you have to follow them, at least here? Do you have control? You have control, okay. Then. I'm Srinivas of SRM University. I have a point here. Yes, please. Regarding this, uh, what is it, internal test as well as uh, final exams, uh -huh. we do have very much control over the question paper since uh, private universities have that flexibility. Uh, I'll tell a small point there. Mm -hmm. uh, two types of uh, detailed questions are there generally in many universities. Either we go for either a part or sometimes five out of seven or mm -hmm. five out of eight. What we ensure in our department is if, if we take the pattern of five out of eight, Three questions will be of problematic and five will be of theoretical. Mm -hmm. The problem again is, out of the 60 students in my class, who are all generally above the good level, say 20 percentage, mm -hmm. they attempt that uh, three out of mm -hmm. the eight, which are problematic. And again, the what we say as average students, mm -hmm. again, back to the old part of only five. Mm -hmm. So, so the, this is the way, I mean, though the question paper out, is yeah. there, this is the main mean. Slowly we are able to bring them up, but yeah. uh, the speed is quite very slow. I think my comment here would be what is said that we really value, that's what should be on the exam. So suppose you, I mean it's individual, I'm not making a judgment here, <laughs> but suppose you as an instructor really values this problem solving skill. Put five problem solving questions so that everybody has to answer at least two. Then the question is well if they don't pass, you know my principal will or I'll be in trouble or the college is in trouble with some accreditation. That's the next problem, okay, how can we change the levels of the questions? Maybe make some of, two of the problem solving questions easier. Uh, one, yeah. so one solution is, uh, you can have A, B and so mm -hmm. on. So one can be problem, one can be the right. even every question we can right. have. That is yeah. one solution. Okay, yeah. But uh, one thing I want to emphasize, conceptual questions do add small ones often. We don't do it because for us, it, these look like, if you see a numerical problem or a big derivation, we think that's hard. But really what we want students to do is to be able to reason, represent, argue. But we, we rarely, I won't say never, but it never occurs to us that we have to put these, ask questions like why did this happen or, uh, so fairly simple but questions which require students to give reasons, do keep putting them here and there. It could be part A of the bigger derivation. Yeah, here I have something to share. Actually, in my courses, most of the time, I, I may not have very weak students if I'm offering an elective, but I do have below average and some average. And it, it ends up that almost everybody gets a 70% in the final exam. So there is always a criticism that, no, you ask them what is known and all these things. But uh, if somebody else looks at the question paper, it will have a lot of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. 
how i do is that in my classroom teaching i train them to think see most of yeah. the weak students don't have the training on how to think so that is why they are not able to think so as you said we design that small small questions which are doable even by an average right and then take it slowly to the level they may fail at some level but to some extent they will so that training is given sufficient and the first test which i give i give it in a way it's doable by everyone so okay. first first test is doable by everyone almost 90% of the class so that they get the confidence that yeah we can do a better paper then when i see 90% has achieved that level my second test i make it it is 80% doable so by that time what happens towards the end of the course it happens that 70% paper is done by all and average people don't do 30% but it's okay because you said that even i feel that objective is learning yeah. not teaching so even if i have made them learn by giving them 100 problems and training them sure. people may say you didn't develop that thinking you trained them but finally that much they have achieved in the learning process and that that question is actually debatable how much is it these clicker questions usually people don't do very well but if you do the thing is if you do sufficient numbers of them yeah they'll start the, doing yeah well. so but then it comes back to us if my goal is that they learn this why not let it no harm in training exactly we can train them and make them learn it's okay if everybody may not be a uh, genius to think in the first level and but the second uh, comment is this whole gaussian distribution and all that it, it's <laughs> we all i think we all agree there that if the whole class is getting to 75% that's actually a very good thing No, I say you can check the paper. Like the right, quality right, of right. the paper has not gone down. Absolutely. And if yeah. you have been able to bring, then why not? Let it be as it is. <laughs> right. Other comments. Okay. A uh, few other strategies, and some of these are really short, cute little things. Uh, I'll just spend a moment on the first one. I, I mean, I, I should not really have put it here, but I put it just for my conscience, especially the last one. I'm sure all of us agree that we need to let students. Know, we need to first care about students, but the thing is, we also need to let them know one way or the other that we care about their learning and their well-being. And sometimes we just don't do it because we think it's assumed. So I want to spend time on the first point a little bit. What do I mean by chunking? There's this idea. Uh, this guy called Miller in sometime in the 50s. He said that uh, well. the original idea is that working memory is very limited for all of us so there's long term memory which where all the associations are built and things are strongly coupled etc which is where we pull things out when we are trying to solve problems but when we are actually doing things it's a working memory which is important now what miller said is he came up with a number he said that there is a number which is uh, let me remember this correctly i think 7 plus or minus 2 facts or 7 plus or minus 2 things i leave this word thing unspecified or what we can have in our working memory at a given time so i'll give i'm going to write a number and uh, okay okay look at it for exactly 10 seconds sorry okay what was the number okay my point now i'm going to write another number just one moment let me write it and i'm going to give you even less time uh, this i want you to look at the number in the bottom okay what was the bottom number okay just making my point so two things have happened firstly actually this is two points i should not have clubbed the two points but firstly the bottom numbers are have a context context is also cultural this is india that's why i put these numbers if i were teaching in the us i'd put uh, something else like 17 when 1494 and stuff like that so cultural context is important but you see the other thing is i've chunked it's the same number of digits but here there are three things i have to remember here there are 12 things i have to remember. So twelve is more than seven plus or minus two, but three is within that range. So this is what's meant by chunking the material. Now, as experts, we are very good at that. We know how to make associations between seemingly far away things, putting it all together into one thing. That's why we remember so many things. There's another common expert novice difference. Experts uh, think of a big uh, of an area as a 
few connected concepts. So, chunked but connected concepts. Novices think of it as many, many disconnected concepts. So, when we want our novices to become experts, we need to train them how to ch chunk them, how to put them together and also how to connect them. So, this is a common example done in psychology labs, but uh, you will have to come up with how you can do this in your own classes. I just find this a very cute little uh, strategy. Um, body language, face the class, etc., is really more important. I mean, it's important for everybody, but especially for junior faculty, and we keep seeing it here. We just, it's just something you need to look at people when you speak, not look at the words. I, I, I really not spend time on this one. Okay, this is more interesting to me. So, I, the last question there I had in the very first slide was what are your goals? You know, we talked about students' goals, setting context and knowing what they know, etc. Let's come to what are your goals. Now, there's two parts to it. First part is what are your goals for your students? And there's this idea called learning objectives. And in fact, right now we have a big MHRD project in, uh, which is being anchored by different IITs. And what we're doing is every course, or many, not every, many science and engineering courses, we are writing what students should be able to demonstrate for every unit. Let's say a unit is a lecture. For every module, which is a series of five or six lectures together, so it's like a chapter maybe, and for the entire course. These are specific performance-based outcomes. So I'll tell you what a learning objective is not. Uh, give me, tell me a topic, um, okay, pointers, let's say. Learning objective is not be able to, uh, it's not understand pointers. It is not be able to appreciate quantum field theory. It is not uh, develop confidence. The reason it's not these is because how do I know if a student has appreciated quantum field theory or not? It's not a demonstrable outcome. So a learning objective, for example, could be, um, I'm going to go back to the slope because I'm more comfortable there. A learning objective could be, be able to calculate a slope given a graph of a straight line and given two points. So now if a student has, it's very clear if a student has able to, uh, has done this or not done this. So we need to be extremely clear about our learning objectives. Textbooks don't have these, notes don't have these. This is not a very commonly done thing in, not even in IITs, definitely not in the university systems. But the clearer we are about what exactly we want our students to be able to do and to be able to learn, uh, it's much easier to set exams. Setting exams is very easy once we have this learning objective document. The downside is writing a learning objective document for a course. Firstly, it's a few, maybe 30, 40 pages because it's excruciatingly detailed. It takes a few months. This big MHRD project we're working on, we are writing these and then we're go going to post them for, uh, the, did Professor Kannan talk to you about the national mission on education through ICT? So this is part of it. So at some point it will be dis disseminated. But I'd encourage you to take a, maybe a small unit, okay, maybe just one lecture. So usually one unit or one lecture has four or five learning objectives. No more than half a dozen because then it gets too cumbersome. Could be just two. But nothing about understanding or appreciating. It has to be apply, design, define, describe. If you want, there's a set of verbs that is recommended that we use for these things. Actually, I have that. If anybody wants to send me email, I'll send it to you. I didn't put it here. The next thing is when we're doing something, the, well, we have these learning objectives, but we need to communicate it with our students. There's some really complicated derivation. This derivation will help you apply X, Y, Z to A, B, C. At some point, students, not at some point, often students need to be told this. And the final one is what I very firmly believe in. We all want them to do good problem solving, etc., but we have to explicitly teach them strategies, not as a theory, but within an example. That, yeah. it's, it's not, these skills are not, unfortunately, they're not implicitly learned. And unfortunately, most of us believe that if I show them how to do it, they'll get it. There's nothing implicit about it. 
uh, if you want them to draw a graph or a picture to solve a problem, put the first step, draw a picture. Make them do it, force them to do it. it. It's boring for them initially, they'll complain, but after five times they'll do it. In the test, say draw a graph, then solve this problem. So explicitly teach and explicitly expect them to do reasoning. Reasoning is the same thing. Let's say you have a problem which is based on a concept. Part A could be explain why this bulb is brighter than that bulb. Part B could be calculate the wattage of this bulb and the wattage of that bulb. So when they explain, they don't use numbers. They actually have to use words or uh, pictures. So this is our goals for our students, what they should learn. Um, any questions at this point? And it comes under this general umbrella of learning objectives. But I think I have a second part of our goals. And it's our own personal growth, intellectual growth, career advancement, and things like that. So these are, I'll just end with these couple of slides. There is a lot of research being done in, apart from technical areas, but also in uh, education research, but domain based. So all these education research things I'm talking about today is not coming from psychology or behavioral science, but from the domain experts, physicists and biologists and computer scientists. There are many universities now that are doing CS education research that is trying to understand how students learn concepts of computer science what strategies work, what sort of, there's a whole thing on visualizations and animations. I didn't even touch about, uh, upon it, but little bit it comes under multiple representations. If you have access to a computer, bring an animation to class. Where to find animations? There are many open source animations available on the net. IITB is developing a big, there's a big project again going on. If you're interested, we can talk about it. The first one, all of you are doing research in your own technical areas. Bring it to the classroom when the context is correct. Students love the new hot things. And you say this is forefront research, bring it to the classroom. Um, I've heard this from a lot of teachers, not a lot, but from some teachers, especially people who, are, who say that academia is not paying well and I'm still junior, I have a lot to go. So the thing is, what is it that an instructor like us can learn from the classroom that is portable also to the industry? So you can use, and this is really not so much for you, this audience here, but if you have to convince your colleagues, you'll have colleagues who'll say, why, you know, I'm, I'm just doing this to, for a year, two years till I get a good job in, in industry. So these are things you can help to convince them. So these are some of the areas in computer science education research. I had done a little bit of literature search. And let me stop here. It's questions, discussions, etc. welcome. Yes, please. This is regarding the question papers, what you were discussing about uh, the, the implementation level questions, no? Mm -hmm. Normally, uh, since it's our, uh, as is deemed university, we have the freedom to set question paper and it is always uh, the implementation level questions what we uh, mm -hmm. have, or most of the questions. Why? Uh, because the, just to invoke the thinking process, ah, like okay, what okay, you right, said. Right, right. And uh, normally what happens is uh, last year we were handling the computer programming paper and since they're coming soon after their plus two uh, mm -hmm. to, the, to a new environment, uh, when the students face such question paper, they, uh, there is a chance to lose their confidence, especially for the average and below average students. However they try, they're not able to uh, answer and come yeah. up with a good grade, yeah. which, were not, which they were not used to right, in their right. previous 12th standard. Uh, 12th right. standard. Yeah. And uh, personally, I have heard from some few students that however we try, we will not be able to answer the questions because uh, in the examination hall, we have to struggle with the questions because uh, it, it will not happen through their preparation. Yeah. Because it's, uh, last year, question paper was too tough. Even the faculty members took right. little time to solve and come up with the answer key and all. So uh, personally, I feel if it is for a first year student, uh, we need to have a uh, balance like yeah, in order to with you, uh, raise their confidence right. level right. so that in the second semester onwards maybe they'll be able to uh, cope up with such papers and uh, grow with, the, with such standards. This is very similar to the point uh, Dr. Sangeeta brought up that you want to train them to get to a certain level and okay one more little con you know one of those little strategies there's this idea called scaffolding and in English, if you're familiar with what scaffolding is, if you go to a construction site, you see these big bamboo poles and the ropes, that's scaffolding. 
So it's a visual metaphor for what we want, what we should be doing as instructors. So it's a very powerful idea in education that we need to give scaffolding when required, but then we need to slowly remove the scaffolding. When the building is built, we remove the scaffolding. So scaffolding are the intermediate steps or make the first exam easy or have a blend of easy and hard questions or in class where marks are not important, have them practice these exams, uh, these questions. So give scaffolding a lot in the beginning. We are not there to prove how smart we are. And then once you have to make a judgment, once the time is right, start removing the scaffolding. So the scaffolding gives them the confidence. I'm yeah. just talking about the first semester. First, it's too yeah. short to train them in a four or five months. But you can start including bits and pieces. So I, I have made this mistake as a novice teacher. I, I set an exam. I was really thrilled with it. Very conceptual, very, very thing. And uh, my postdoc advisor, she saw it and she said, no, you have to rewrite. She just rewrote some of the questions. And I said, these are stupid questions. They are not thinking questions. And her point was this. She said, if you write 15 questions, all of them hard and thing, first, they won't do well and they'll just hate you and they'll never think about these questions. So out of 15, 12 were extremely straightforward. And three or four were this little challenging thinking kinds. This was again first year biology students learning physics and those kind of things. So yeah.